On Thursday, May 16, former Prime Minister Bob Hawke died. He was 89 years old. We found this out via a statement released by his wife, Blanche Del Puget. I spoke to Blanche a little while ago uh, when she released a book called On Longing that detailed her relationship with Bob and the extraordinary and really quite shocking way their love story began and evolved through uh, him leaving his first wife, the very beloved Hazel Hawke, who was First Lady while he was Prime Minister, and how they navigated their life together through the swinging 70s and all the way through that very famous time where they were interviewed by 60 Minutes wearing bathrobes. She said in a statement, Today we lost Bob Hawke, a great Australian, many would say the greatest Australian of the post-war era. Bob was dearly loved by his family and so many friends and colleagues. We will miss him. I thought it was a perfect time to revisit the interview that I did with Blanche. When she spoke about Bob, her whole face lit up. She's the most incredible woman and their love story, while fraught in many ways and controversial, is one of the most epic of our times. Here's Blanche Del Puget. Tell me about the first day you met Bob. It was in Jakarta. In ni- it was April 1970. It was almost 50 years ago. Yes. Uh, my husband and I had just arrived back there. We'd lived there before and we are staying in the Hotel Indonesia. He was also staying in the Hotel Indonesia, but we didn't meet in the hotel. We met at a party at a mutual friend's from the embassy. And uh, we just clicked. There were sparks? Not sexual sparks, not on my part, not on my side. I, I hadn't been long married and I was very keen on my husband. Mm. Uh, I think on his side he was definitely interested, but men are a bit like that, aren't they? They are. Especially that one. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> and we just sat on one of those swinging chair things. I didn't know who the hell he was. I thought his name was Robin. I'd never heard of him because I'd been living out of Australia for so long. Mm. We sat on one of those swinging chairs chairs and I knew Jakarta very well and he was very interested so he asked lots and lots of questions and we talked about all kinds of things. That's always very attractive in a man isn't it when he asks questions. Yes and the thing that I found most attractive about him was that he didn't want to go and see the kampongs where the poor lived in absolute dire poverty with open drains. Nearly all the people I took around Jakarta no, nearly all men, they always wanted to see the kampongs, how the, how the poor of the city lived. And, and I think it was to give themselves a warm inner glow about, oh, we come from a superior country. Mm. And when he didn't ask for that, I thought, you're a really decent guy. And what happened after that? How did you stay in contact? Or you, you oh, lost didn't. contact for we a didn't. while? No. He came back the following year. And uh, we had a sort of all-night party in our house with a great deal of alcohol consumed. It was the 70s. It it was, uh, that's right, it was 1971. And the Vietnam War was raging and we were arguing like hell about that. Everyone was arguing about it. Everybody was arguing about it. And he had his his daughter Sue with him, his eldest child. She, poor thing, had to put up with all of this stuff. (laughs) And then I didn't see him again until 1976. That's when you started writing a biography of, of Sir, Sir Richard, Kirby. Richard Kirby. And did you reach out to say, hey, can I interview you for my book? I did. And what happened when you saw each other again? You hadn't seen each other for a while. Uh, yes. And he actually did remember me. And, um, well, this time the click was different. Was your marriage in a different place? My marriage was in a very different place. It was going down the drain. And um, so, yes, we, there was a very strong attraction to each other, which we uh, followed up. It was, as you say, the 70s. You wrote, um, with mutual wordless consent, it was agreed we would become lovers as soon as possible, which happened to be in a different city the following night. He was late and arrived wearing pancake makeup. I presume that was from television. It not was. Just for, not just for lols. <laughs> um, did he enchant me with flowers, chocolate sentiments? On the contrary, he was charming, funny and straightforward. He liked me and enjoyed talking to me. What he loved was sex. That's exactly right. 
What are your other memories of that night? He was still married, you were married, but it was the 70s. So can you kind of talk about what the sort of climate or the moral seems like too big a word, but the decision to, I suppose, you know, have embark on an affair, was that a big decision? Not really. Again, we come back to it was the 70s and I was a feminist. I was in the uh, women's movement and very active. We didn't believe in monogamy. Uh, we believed in uh, liberty, equality and sorority and supporting other women and um, affairs were par for the course. They were part of that life. But one tried to be discreet mm. and, and not hurt anybody. That was also part of it. And where did things go from there? Was it seen as this is just a one-nighter or the chemistry was, was clearly something more? The chemistry was very strong. And it was clearly not a one-nighter. Was that discussed? How not at all. How you would navigate that? No, never discussed. Never discussed. And uh, it just sort of flowed at its own pace. And I, so there was that night and then I didn't hear from him at all for, th- for three weeks until he turned up in town again and said, can you get out? <laughs> It's funny thinking of a time before electronic communication where you couldn't stay in constant contact. I suppose you could have written letters to each other. That would have been very foolish. But Bob doesn't strike me as the letter writing sentimental type, is he? No. No. (laughs) So they would have been one-way letters from you? Yes. And, of course, they would leave a trail of evidence. Exactly. So um, to be discreet, I suppose, which, which sort of is, is so much about what, what you're, the, the name of your book on lust and longing, that idea of longing, these periods when you can't be together. Yes. How did you navigate that and how did you sort of reconcile it as it wasn't just sex, you wanted to be with him for more than that? I honestly at the time didn't want to be with him for more than sex. I only wanted to be with him for sex. <laughs> <laughs> surprise, surprise, I enjoyed it. I like it. <laughs> uh, I was, I'd was. i started writing and I was mad keen on writing. So we're in the lust phase, not the we're, longing phase we're yet. We're certainly in the lust phase. Yeah. And uh, and my, my longing was to become a writer. I'm sorry, I do have to cough. Please do. <coughs> Do you want some water out of your Bob yes, Hawke water some, bottle? Yes, I want some water out of my special. I think, it's, I think it's Bob wanting to be involved in this story. I think he is. He's <laughs> creeping in. Go on. Hard to get rid of him. Um, so I was, I was passionate about work mm. and writing. And, um, and I was also pa- very passionate about my son. Uh, How old was he? Uh, Louis, he was born in uh, 70... Um, Two, sometimes I get it wrong. So seventy. So he's forty-five now. Yeah, he's forty-five now. So he was by seventy-six. He he was just a little a little darling. Yeah. And so you were really passionate about your writing career. Yes. And at this stage, had you split from your husband? No. So it was just uh, when you're in town, Bob and you would have a good time. Yes. And because I was so active in the women's movement, I did. I must admit use that sometimes as a cover I used to sometimes say oh I'm going out to the women's refuge where I used to work but it was really something the women's refuge in those days these Mm. were poor women who were being beaten by their Mm. husbands and there was nowhere for them to go and they'd have little children and so we we women who mm. who uh, were protected and so forth used to go there and patrol and used to have to threaten the husbands. I can remember one night picking up a can of baked beans and threatening to hit a man with Blanche, it. Blanche, you're tiny. I'm tiny, but I'm very fierce. <laughs> I believe that. <laughs> I believe that. What did feminism look like in the 70s? What did it feel like? It was It was kind of madness it was wonderful it for many women it was sort of a new religion because of the what we had called consciousness raising sessions in which women they learned to question all the things they'd been brought up with like what that you had to be married number one mm. that you gave up your career for your husband 
Num- uh, number two, the looking after children was the most important thing you could do and keeping the house nice and keeping keeping yourself nice. Yeah. Uh, that fidelity was very important. Don't forget the pill. It was a, an extraordinary period between the introduction of the pill and there were no sexually transmitted diseases. Oh, happy days. So there was a there was genuine feeling of liberation and women were doing things they'd never da- dared think of doing before. The husband had come home and say, well, what's for dinner? And the reply was, oh, would you like to make it? Which was really transgressive. A very, very transgressive. Yeah, and unimaginable just a few years earlier. Yes. And then women were going, getting jobs. That it, it was transgressive. I can remember having a great argument with a really conservative friend of mine who said to me, why would I want to work in a pickle factory? And I thought, I couldn't get it through her head. You don't have to work in a pickle factory. It's not There the are other to, kinds of jobs. There are other kinds of jobs, yeah. You know, when you talk about that freedom and that idea of enjoying sex, it's hard for women of my generation to imagine a time when you would have been so worried about pregnancy because birth control was pretty slapdash and hit and miss, yes. so to speak. That must have really infringed on women's ability to enjoy sex. I did. thought that, oh, my God, uh, I could get pregnant. Of course it did. Terribly. And suddenly that was removed. So the lid was taken off the pressure cooker. Wow. <laughs> yeah. And that idea that women could also enjoy sex, that it wasn't just something that had to be endured or lie back and think of it's England. England. Yeah. Could enjoy it. And there were a lot of, uh, a lot of the consciousness raising sessions were about sex and uh, how to enjoy it and what to do, etc. I think a lot of that's been forgotten, you know. Yeah, it's very true. In the in the age of dick pics, yes. there's not a lot in it for a woman that receives a dick pic. It's not a very sexy experience. Oh, no. I'm <laughs> glad to say I never have. Yeah. Oh, Blanche, there's still time. Um, <laughs> yes, yes. Before I turn 80. <laughs> exactly. Put, put it on your bucket list. <laughs> When did things really shift between you and Bob? When when did it turn from lust to love for you? Oh, within a couple of years. Every time he was in town, that is in Canberra, yeah. or I was in Melbourne mm-hmm. or in Sydney were, uh, doing research, um, we we would hook up. And so within two, two years, it had, it had turned into love. I knew he had lots and lots of other women, lots of. And uh, some very long time favourites. Um, How did you become aware of that? Because you write um, in your book, uh, you said you came to realise that he was having affairs all over the country and that his love life was a kind of freewheeling, decentralised harem with four or five favourites and a shoe sale queue of one night stands. Yes. <laughs> I love it. How did you become aware of that or did he just never try to hide it? Uh I'm not sure. I th- think it was it was part intuition, and part it was gossip. Uh, women talking to me and gossiping. Uh, what was his role at this point? Was it head of the ACTU? He, he was then head of yes. Yeah. He was. He'd just become head of the ACTU when I met him in 1970. Yes. And so, were you jealous when you found out? Were you angry? Initially, I was insanely jealous, and. Then I just got over that. How did you get over it? I mean, besides the fact that you were both each still married. That helped a lot. (laughs) (laughs) Uh, And I did have other interests. uh, You also had other lovers. I had other lovers. It was still the 70s. It was still the 70s, yes. Um, Well, I I just got over. I realised how stupid it was to be jealous of, of uh, p- particularly of a man like him, uh, um, nothing was going to stop that. And where and the thing, it's, it might be hard to understand now, but he really was a rock star. Women absolutely threw themselves at him, and he was in public all the time and enormously extrovert. But they mm. really threw themselves uh, 
at him. So, And it's an interesting phenomenon. I was just talking to um, one of my friends who works here and she was saying when she was quite young, when she was a kid, her mum took her to some public event to meet Bob because – she loved him so much, even as a little kid, because there was something about him. He wasn't the most conventionally good-looking man, but he had a charisma that you can see how much he loves women. Loves everybody. Yeah, loves women, children, animals, uh, men. Men, yeah, the yeah. lot. He really loves people and life. And, and, and you're right, and children. He particularly and that's magnetic, loves magnetic, right? Yes, and he particularly loves children. And he loves dogs. <laughs> he once said to me, nothing's better than to see a little boy with a happy dog. <laughs> oh, that's so true. <laughs> true. And so, you know, you decided that you weren't going to be jealous, which sounds very pragmatic, mm. but I'll take your word for it. It was the 70s. And then he ended the relationship, didn't he? Because he said he was going to leave his wife, Hazel, for you. Was there any discussion about leaving all the others? Or it was just going to be that he was going to get a divorce and he was to going be to get you. a divorce and we were going to be together. But I mean, it was so it was so ridiculous. Did we you did, want that? I said I'd think about it for two months over the Christmas break, and I thought about it a lot. And what I realised was I really wanted to leave my own marriage, mm. but I didn't want to go with him because I knew. That would be the end of my career as a writer. Why? Because he, he would absorb so much energy so, because he lived in such a, a spin cycle of the washing machine life and I wouldn't have the really boring, quiet life that a writer le- leads and that's what I needed and I could get that um, either if I lived on my own um, or married to my first husband. But I chose to live on my own. You were complete. You didn't need him to complete you. No. I, uh, that's right. Thank you for saying that. <laughs> I should Thank have you written the book for you, but <laughs> Yes. <laughs> <laughs> well, no, I know because you were very much a, a feminist role model. I've talked to my mum about it before, and she talks about jumping ahead a little bit. When you finally did marry Bob and you guys got together officially, that you seemed to stop working and stop writing for quite some time. I did. And that is because, Mia, my, I really, truly believe that life's greatest reward and highest ideal is love. And I'd waited a long while for this relationship. Mm. We were madly in love with each other. And for me, love was everything. So I was prepared to give up uh, writing. I also think that that by that stage I was pretty much written out and I needed a break. Writers do need a break. Um, So, yes, I I gave up writing. We we set up a a business together, a consultancy business, and – or he'd set it up and I joined as a director. And then we just travelled every six weeks. So it was it was wonderfully exciting and very very stimulating and I and I started to get from that uh, not new material for for a book as it would turn out but just a, a, a wider perspective on the world than I'd had beforehand. Mm. There was thirty years between um, twenty five years between meeting him and getting married. Your relationship went through so many phases in that time from the you know, just quite a physical thing to um, more serious to then a long period of time where you didn't see each other. Apart. You were yes. apart. Yes. Tell me about what that was like and what precipitated it. Uh, well, what precipitated it was that he had decided he wanted to go into Parliament and the only thing he wanted to do in Parliament was to become Prime Minister and he couldn't come become Prime Minister if he were divorced back, at, back in those days. Mm, it was the early 80s? Yep. Uh, and we couldn't go on. So he, His, so you said it would have leaked, so he had to end it? Well, you had he to had to end it. Together. I wanted to end it too. Because, Why did you want to end it? Well, I was, terribly, I was terribly angry with him for asking me to marry him. And I thought about it and I realised I wanted to leave my husband. And then he was, Bob was still keen on the marriage idea. And so... 
we went along assuming that, that was what was going to happen next. But I kept on thinking, what about Louis? How? how I can't lo- leave him in Canberra. I can't go and I can't live with Bob in Melbourne. How is all of this going to work? It was just an impossible th- mm. thing. And then one day he. He didn't contact, well, one week he didn't contact me, another week he didn't contact me, a third week he didn't contact me, which was frightful. And I nearly went baresque. Uh, and then he just rang up and said, not getting into all, just like that. I, I couldn't understand what he was talking about. And I had asked him to repeat it. He said, I'm not getting divorced. And that was the end of it. He uh, almost ghosted you. Eh? He almost ghosted you. Have you heard that expression? Ghosting when someone just disappears on you and you don't hear from him again. Yes, At least he, he said he, to you. Yes, he did. He for did three weeks go- he ghosted you. For sort of three weeks he ghosted me. Uh, I was During that period I, was, I wasn't able to write a word. I was so mm. upset. And then, to, and then he um, announced he dumped me. So, look, I understood why. And after I'd got over the... Terrible fury <laughs> <laughs> and wanting to yeah. murder him. It's like I didn't want to marry you, but you can't break up with me. <laughs> Try to, yes, I didn't really <laughs> want to marry you, but you can't do this to me. Uh, that's intelligent, isn't it? So <laughs> I, I, I thought, well, I hardly know this man, and the I really hardly knew him although we'd seen each other so often, but in such a narrow, narrow context. And I thought, and the Australian public intuitively knows something about him, but the, he was presented by the news media as a kind of cartoon from the man I knew. Mm, that's and true, the sort of ochre, larrikin, it's beer exactly, swilling. Exactly. Isn't he in the Guinness Book of World Records for beer drinking or something? Yes, yes, he yeah. is, which goes back to But his also a Rhodes Scholar. Yeah, well, yes, and the beer drinking goes back to his time as a Rhodes Scholar. Right. Uh, so I, th- I thought I, I will write about what he is really like as he wants to really become Prime Minister. The Australian public should really know what the, who and what this man is and what he stands for, what his values are. And so that's what I set out to do. Was that just a way to stay in his life, though? I... Well, maybe it was. Um, look, I didn't think of it in those terms. Really, I th- I thought of it in professional terms mm. because I'd I'd written a biography beforehand of of um, a judge, and it had been very successful. Not in terms of money, but in terms of of uh, respect mm. for what I'd said, and I. I just thought you this, backed yourself. You knew you could do it. I knew I could do it, and I thought, and this one might make some money. <laughs> 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 might because only might. I couldn't get a publisher at the time. Mm. A, 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 a really was um, he already leader of the opposition? No, he wasn't in, even <gasps> in parliament when oh. I started work. Um, and people I went to, the the publisher said to me. Oh no, he's finished. He's had it because he'd had that. He'd had a huge and ridiculous um, fight in in Adelaide, and in which he'd very vulgarly abused Bill Hayden, who was the leader of the opposition. And the whole of the press corps had written him off as a rat bag and self destructive, and so forth. And he was because he was still drinking. Mm. And when I started writing, I had a few doubts uh, because he was still drinking. but I'd, About whether he'd go the distance. Uh, he was going to either ex- yeah. self-destruct or he was going to make it. And the, and the self-destruction was going to be through grog. And I do think I helped him stop drinking. Because Did you ever say to him, you've got to stop drinking or you're not going to become Prime Minister? Oh, or I, it wasn't I, that I, I and a th- I and about 10,000, yeah, well, right. I and all his other, <laughs> all his close friends all said the same thing to him. And Hazel would have said it to him a million times too. And what finally made him stop? Well, I went down and interviewed his family in South Australia. And I came back 
with and told him the stories that they had told me about how against drink his mother was and that she'd enrolled him in this band of little little Nazarenes who and at the age of eight he was sworn never to let alcohol pass his lips. I mean, how to turn your son into a drunk. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> but didn't work. Yeah, yeah. could yes, but of good course job. she didn't. People were wise after the event, and bringing all of that family stuff back to him was very very shocking, mm-hmm. because he'd he'd sub, I think he'd conveniently suppressed it, suppressed yeah. it all. Yeah. So, How much did Hazel know about you? Um, quite a bit. Look, I, you never know how much somebody else knows about you, but she certainly knew of me. She knew Bob was in lo- had been in love with me. She knew he'd wanted to marry me. Um, yeah. Because he's not the kind of guy who can keep a lot of secrets, it would say. He's not. He's not. And he's, he's a very bad liar. His nature, I mean, was obvious to you and was no doubt obvious to her being married to him for that long. Did she kind of turn a blind eye? I honestly don't know that. Mm. Um he had a very long-term relationship with his uh, personal assistant, much far... The 20-year relationship, you said, yeah. Yes, far pre- predated me. So she, Hazel, much more disliked that woman than me. And apparently there was some other silly woman who who's, who stalked him and rang him at home and, and so forth. Um, so she disliked that. But I was always very discreet and in the background and never seen And did in you feel jealous of Hazel for being his wife? At this distance, I honestly can't answer that. But I think the, the honest answer is probably yes. I think that the... Uh, the lover always feels jealous of the wife because the wife's got ownership. <laughs> well, that's where he's going home every night, isn't that's, it? Yes, yes. Well, whatever that's going to be like, and you don't know. And he and I had a, had a, a sort of an a, an unspoken, a, honourable agreement. Neither of us ever talked about our spouses. Mm. I didn't talk about my husband. He didn't talk about Hazel. So I honestly don't know that. What, what it was like, except friends have told me that it was pretty ugly. Mm. They're, they're friends who, who used to go to the house. So you, you were apart for, what, six years? Uh, yeah. And how did things start? And when you were writing the book, did he not, like, try it on, you know, it's late at night, we're still talking interviews? Uh, f- very first on. night when we, was st- <laughs> when we were still, when he was still drinking, he did. Every uh, night? Did he try it on? No. Right, no. just that first time. Because it took a long time. To, it takes a long time to write a book. You have to get spend a lot of time with your subject if you're writing a biography. Um, you have to spend much more time with other people, actually. Oh, okay. Much more time. So the times I spent with him were, were nothing compared with the times I spent with others. So he tried it on and you said, no, we've broken up. We've broken up, yeah. Mm. And then when did you get back together? In, um, hang on, 1990, no, that can't be right, 1988. So he left the Prime Ministership by then? Not quite. He just made the Kirribilli Agreement. I see. That was the agreement where... With, the agreement was made at Kirribilli House, the Prime Minister's house in Sydney, and it was an agreement with Paul Keating that... In two years, Bob would step down and Keating would take over, could take over as Prime Minister. And so suddenly Bob obviously felt, ah, oh, freedom. Yeah. Because yeah. he knew that he couldn't divorce Hazel while oh, he was in oh office. Oh, no. That was never going to happen. That was never going to happen. It had no. to be on the other side of that. Yes. But no, no sitting Prime Minister, I mean, I can't think of any Prime Minister who's ever actually stood down willingly no one really goes of their own accord, do they? Menzies did, but he was ill. Mm. And he'd also been Prime Minister for a very, very long while and he was getting old. And uh, if Harold Holt was to have any chance at all, he had to go when he did. Mm. And so the Kirribilli Agreement famously didn't quite work out in the way it was intended. Um, and 
when did you realise he was the big love of your life? I mean, obviously before now. Uh, probably after we resumed in in eighty out, but I think it wouldn't have been until eighty nine or or ninety. It, it it became more increasingly intense, and it became hard to be apart. Yes, but we weren't so far apart because as soon as he fe- ceased being prime minister, which was uh, December ninety one. Uh, he moved from Canberra to Sydney, and I was already by then living in Sydney. And he he moved. I was living in Wallara, and he moved into. He and Hazel moved into a hotel in Double Bay, so it was just down the street. And why wouldn't he leave her at this stage? Well, she was not well. Mm. That was number one. She'd she'd had um, a tumor on her pituitary gr- gland. So he wouldn't think of leaving her. And I don't think at any stage really then did he think of leaving her. It wasn't until 93 when something happened to me that he suddenly realised he, he couldn't live without me. What happened to you in 93? I was in a, a seaplane. I was up in the far, uh, far north Queensland. I was doing a story for the New York Times on the Great Barrier Reef, and the seaplane crashed into the sea. And we had to uh, swim out a window. Oh, my God. There were, there were six passengers in the pilot, and we were very lucky to um, be alive because um, we, we all grabbed onto the, 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 the wings and avgas was pouring out of them and covering us. It's, and it's very, very burny, I can assure you. <laughs> I don't do, oh <laughs> recommend a bath and avgas at any stage. And uh, um, fortunately, um, a yachtsman was moored not too far away and he had a motorised dinghy and he leapt in his dinghy and came rushing over. We all grabbed onto the dinghy and the plane sank. But when we got ashore onto Hamilton Island, we were allowed to make one phone call. And I, the one phone call I made was to our go-between, the man who, who kept us in con- He was our secret um, oh. contact. And, but he was a drama queen. And he rang up Bob and he said, Bob, Blanche has been in a plane crash. And paused and Bob said in that moment he felt himself die and then the man added but she's all right but it was just that instant uh, and he he knew then that it was had I died it would have been a his life wouldn't have been worth living what's it like when you don't have to hide anymore Oh, it was marvellous. <laughs> it was absolutely marvellous. But the interesting... Does it take a while to get used to, though? Um, like, oh, you're just in the other room. Oh, yeah, we can go out and have dinner together Oh, in a we can just hold hands in public. How yeah. wonderful. Um, it, that was absolutely marvellous. But th- what I found very interesting, I, I cleaned out the storeroom a couple of weeks ago and I had newspaper articles and, ma- and um, magazines back I don't know how many years And I hadn't realised that I was actually quite famous. But before I was with Bob, and up until 1994, I really was the golden girl. Yeah. And I was one of the 50 most eligible women in Australia and my writing was all terrific and so forth. Come 94 and I'm with Bob, suddenly I am the world's worst person. And... um, you know, Mrs. Caligula sort of thing. <laughs> and a tra- the idea of you as being a trophy wife. Uh, yeah, I was a trophy wife. All my other books, which were sold in a number of languages, my novels and so forth, that was all ignored. I just became Bob Hawke's biographer. So uh, mm. I couldn't write. I was, I was r- r- reduced. reduced in size. And Mia, I have to tell you, unfortunately... The worst people were uh, women, were other women. How did that play out before the days of social media? How did uh, women's displeasure make itself known to you? Articles they wrote, things they said to friends. I had a very good friend, uh, another writer, and she said to me, 
plants the rancor against you is unbelievable. I had no idea. Why do you think that was? Look, I've I've thought about it. I think it was fear mostly. I think it was women thinking, oh, that could happen to me. Mm. Um, some minx could come along and take my bloke. As if he had no agency. Exactly. <laughs> As if it were my doing. And the the suggestion that I'd broken their marriage was was horrendous. I hadn't. It, it had been broken for a lo- very long while uh, and we'd been in love for a very long while. Mm. Yeah. It, it was just grotesque, really. Did you ever talk to Hazel? Did you interview her for the book? Sure. Yes, several times. Yes. And what was that like? Well, she and I both steeled ourselves for it. Imagine. Uh, It was not pleasant for either of us, but we both took it like grown-ups. She knew that if it were a good book, it would advance his career and advance his ambitions to become Prime Minister. Mm. And and I interviewed her right after, or soon after he'd stopped drinking, which showed her that he really was serious and so that everything she'd put up with from the uh, uh, the women and, and the drinking and blah, blah, blah could all now be coming to what was her very justified reward and that is that she would live in the lodge and and have Kira Billy House and have a have a, the status of being the Prime Minister's wife. So I think all of those things came into her thinking he he'd had to persuade her very strongly th- uh, to be to, interviewed. To be interviewed by me, she really didn't want to, but but she she came around and agreed, and we were just very straight with each other. Oh, the elephants in the room during that conversation! My goodness. <laughs> yeah, I guess so. Yeah. Did you speak to her after the divorce, or it was just yes, sure, uh, because we had to talk about the kids on occasions. Yeah. Her kids and... Her, yes, but her and Bob's kids, yes. And how did you forge a relationship? And, with... and, and, we, and we would see each other socially sometimes mm-hmm. at Christmas, for example, in, in one of the... in Sue's house, yeah. There was this sense, I suppose, publicly that people had to choose a side. Were they Team Hazel or Team Blanche? Yes. Why do people think that? Yeah, as if Hazel didn't have any agency either. Yeah, it it it's it, it's insulting to to everybody. Mm. They don't have to choose sides, and a number of our friends didn't at all. They they stayed good friends with Hazel, and they were good friends with me. You and Bob, in those early years when you first came out publicly together, were so um, you were like <laughs> teenagers. You were giddy. In, and, and you weren't – it's not like you'd just met. I mean, you'd known each other for, what, upwards of 30 years or yes. or more. And y- you had been together on and off through much of that time. But there was clearly such a joy that you both took in each other. Yes. You were about 55 when you got married? No, no, 51. 51. Yes. And he – Was 65. And there was that famous 60 Minutes interview you did in the bathrobes. Let me tell you about those bathrobes. Tell me. We were fully dressed. Under the bathrobes. Under the bathrobes. It. <laughs> it was a real gotcha. Um, fully dressed on our way to the airport out of the hotel in Singapore. We walked past the swimming pool with the photographer's tray and they said, oh, let's get a, a photograph of you by the pool. And I said, no way. And they said, look, we'll we'll just get uh, from the pool shop some bathrobes. So we put them on over our clothes. And if you look closely, you can actually see <laughs> the top of my shirt <laughs> under, <laughs> underneath it. And and so, and he sat on a, on a chaise longue and I, stu- uh, uh, I stood behind him. And they took the photographs and the palm trees and blah, yeah. blah, blah. And... Then they painted out all the palm trees. Oh, right. So it didn't and look just like you by the pool. Looked like so, so, uh, uh, and just put in blue. So everybody imagined, oh, this is them 
together. I know. <laughs> We've suffered from it ever since. <laughs> oh, that's very funny backstory. Um, you clearly took such a delight just in being with each other, though. We did and yeah. still do. And still do. And still do, yeah. Um, you know, Lust is, is part of the title of your book and you've talked a lot about your and Bob's chemistry. You've, you know, had a sexual relationship on and off for 50 years. <laughs> How does sex change as you get older? Uh, well, it doesn't have the same drama as when you're young, but it has a, a greater sweetness, I think. You know, like late pick grapes make yeah. uh, late pick wine, stickies, as they're called. Yeah, I was yeah. Trying to think of oh, the other Blanche, word. We're getting into such <laughs> bad metaphors here. Uh, very, very but. bad word. <laughs> uh, but. But there's it's, a tenderness or what? A there's tenderness a, there's a about huge it, a tenderness and un- understanding and you feel so so enormously comfortable with each other and you communicate with each other yeah. and you're completely uninhibited. Physically, I'm, I'm not going to get too personal, but in terms of, you know, you're a very beautiful woman at this age, at every age. How do you, you know, reconcile growing older? And, and ageing and, you know, how that impacts on your physicality and I suppose how sexy you feel. I do keep myself very fit uh, and I love feeling fit and, mm. and healthy. Um, and uh, I visit the hairdresser. <laughs> very natural blonde. I'm a completely <laughs> natural blonde. <laughs> and just... Finally, yes. I'll let you have a, have a sip of your coffee. Uh, can I have a sip of coffee? Of course you can have oh, a sip of coffee. Oh, everything's allowed yeah, in here. Yeah, very free, free and easy. <laughs> when you think back on your life with Bob, what is the most joyous period of that time? Oh, gosh. We've had some t- truly marvellous holidays. We went to the Antarctic for my 60th birthday. That was just fabulous and there was a we went on a small Russian ship and there was a big party for me on deck as we went through the oh let me get it right Lamia oh no I've got it wrong anyway this beautiful passage divinely beautiful scenery that was really wonderful it wasn't half bad going for dinner at Buckingham Palace (laughs) you know when the the car drives around (laughs) The well, I don't know, but I can get. Well, I've seen it on TV. And suddenly, <laughs> and suddenly, it turns left in the, through wow. the gates of Buckingham into the gates of Buckingham Palace, and and there's the red carpet and uh, all those men with the big bear skins on their <laughs> supposed bear skins on their heads, <laughs> <laughs> and uh, footmen and so forth. And I thought, wow, <laughs> this is very very wow. But with je- with him. I think, honestly, the happiest times when we were, were out fishing. Mm. Just <laughs> being together. Just being together, yes. And either at, at, at home reading or if we weren't at home reading, out catching fish on a boat. You like to fish. Yes, I, yes, I was brought up fishing and he's mad keen on fishing. And he's a man keen on golf, of which, in which I have no interest whatsoever. <laughs> <laughs> but that that was always great fun, and we have competitions who'd get the first fish. He would nearly always win until recently, uh, which he's <laughs> always thought, which he's always said, I've cheated. <laughs> Something I didn't get to ask you about um, that, in fact, is how your book opens is with this extraordinary, you call it a love affair, but it was really sexual abuse by a 55-year-old neighbour who was a pedophile when you were 12. Yes. You had a relationship with him ongoing for many years after that, didn't you? Oh, no, no, not many years. No, no, no. Between 12 and 15 or 12 and 14. That's two years. Yes. That's a long time. Yes, but it wasn't every day or every week or anything like and that. And you didn't recognise it as abuse. No, he, and it wasn't abuse. But it was. You were 12 and he was 55. I know, but I 
this is a really important thing, Mia. Women, however, whether they're 12 or mm. 200, must never give away their power. And I never gave away my power to that man. And so I never felt in his power. I always felt completely free, free agent that I could just walk away from him at any stage. But I had something which these poor children who are abused by uh, teachers and priests and mm. scoutmasters and God knows what didn't have. And that was I had a seriously terrifying father. Whom, who was violent who was, towards who you was and violent, your mother. Yes, and would have been much more violent to this man who was frightened of him. He was a judge, this man. He was a district court judge, that's true. Yes. But he knew that if, if I ever told my father, his, his neck would have been broken. Was he ever caught or no. charged or? Never, never charged, never caught, gave the most horrendous uh, sentences, horrendously harsh sentences to sex offenders. It's yeah. going to come out in a book next year. About him, the 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 author wrote to me and asked, "Is it him that you wrote about?" And I confirmed that it was him because he he was notorious in the 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 um, harshness of his sentences, while at the same time being a sexual predator. Well, yes, I thought of you a lot um, around the whole Barnaby Joyce thing, Vicky, with Vicky Campion, because as much as we like to think attitudes have changed, they haven't really. I mean. That, how did you view that whole sordid chapter? Well, I didn't view it as sordid to start with. I think the media made it sordid. Mm. Um, I felt a great deal of compassion for both of them and, and for um, Barnaby's wife who apparently didn't know about the relationship. Mm. That uh, One doesn't know what she did or, or, mm. or didn't know. But he clearly had been unhappily, unhappy in his marital relationship for some time. He actually said that in Parliament. And I think she used the expression, his, his wife, he's a hard dog to keep on the porch. Oh, did she say she that? Said, I, I don't know if know. she said it publicly, but she was reported to have said it, which is something that could have been said about Bob, I imagine. That oh, kind yes. of guy. Yes. Yeah. E exactly. And it was originally Hillary Clinton said it of Bill. Ah, uh, okay. That's maybe where that's, that comes from. That's what it, Oh, okay. Yes. No, you're 100% right. Hillary said it of Bill. Yes. So I think it was then maybe paraphrased around Barnaby, but could have also been said about Bob. Uh, absolutely. Yeah. And and before me, it was an impossible dog to keep on the porch. <laughs> um, so I... I thought he was madly, I hope it's still mm. the truth, that he was madly in love with her and, mm. it, and it's that. mutual. And I thought he did the, he, and he doesn't know if he's the father of the child or not. And so I thought it was extraordinarily honourable of him to say, whether I'm the father of this baby or I'm not, I love her and I'm going to bring up the baby as my own. And how many guys have, excuse me saying this, the balls, to say that and and mean it, and I hope that's how, that, that that's how it happens. I mean, I hope it's his baby. But. Was fidelity um, a deal breaker for you when you married Bob and when you guys got back together? It would have been for both of us. Yeah, mm. no, no. Seventies were over. Huh? The seventies were the over. Seventies were over. This was this was a whole. This was new, the nineties. Yes, yes, and and he. He was not a man. Look, he's the silverback gorilla. <laughs> I imagine if he was here, he'd be flirting right now with everybody, men, women, children. Like He's That's right. still very charismatic. So I suppose that part doesn't necessarily change. No, no. And, and flirting is – flirting sort of now getting a bad reputation, but flirting is happiness and friendliness, mm. really. Mm. And also sometimes just it's acknowledging. It's not necessarily sexual. No, sometimes it's just I acknowledge, you know, you can, you can flirt with friends and just have good banter or yeah. good chemistry. Exactly, exactly. I flirt with tradesmen in lifts. Mm. I bet you do. <laughs> <laughs> and I bet they flirt back. Yes. <laughs> You're quite the hottie. <laughs> well, thank you, Mia. <laughs>
Blanche, it's been so beautiful to talk to you. Thank you so much. And please send all my love to Bob. Thank you very much. Thanks for listening to No Filter this week. You can find Blanche's book on lust and longing. It's so fantastic. Uh, It's at any good bookstore or you can get it online at apple.co forward slash Mamma Mia. You'll find all the books of many of the people that we've interviewed here on this podcast. The producer of No Filter is Eliza Ratliff and I will see you at home on the homepage, mamamia.com.au.